Erev Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Got a very interesting email from a, uh, a new friend that we have, a journalist inside of Ukraine, an American journalist, that is, that's been sharing with me some information that's coming out of Ukraine. He also follows Israeli News Live, but journalist in his own right, and definitely he writes some very interesting articles, articles including this latest one that he wrote for Newsfront, uh, called U.S. offers Russia deal on Ukraine, but the price is Syria. And that's exactly what he goes into. Some very interesting leaks coming out of Washington uh, that David shares with us here on the article that he's writing here for uh, Newsfront. Let me just share with you some of the things that are written here, and then I'm going to share with you how that what he writes here seemingly is already in motion. Uh, Moscow, Russia, the middle... Middle East situation is anything but clear as Trump and Lavrov have recently met in a strange overnight emergency meeting. Information leaking out shows that the U.S. is committed to the Syrian regime, regime change and has since been um, way back in the Obama administration, which we all know this. Russian Foreign Ministry Sergei Lavrov's meeting with meeting in Washington's revealed an ongoing dispute between the two countries regarding the fate of Syria. The Trump administration's insisting on cutting the head of Syria's regime and estimated 20 known Assad associates, while Moscow warned from the repetition of the Iraqi-Libyan uh, models in Syria, Western diplomatic sources state. Uh, but here's the problem, though. Even David writes in this article here that the U.S. has no problem with the Assad military staying in power and an Awadi uh, uh, source taking over the control of this. But it's still going to cause an implosion. It is nothing but a disaster waiting to happen. But, you know, Russia may very well take that carrot and go with it because you have to remember Russia has no policy of protecting Bashar al-Assad from an invasion by the United States or any other uh, nations that are there. That's not the agreement he has with the Syrian government. His agreement with Syria was an invitation to come in to fight ISIS. And this is something that Russia has made clear on more than one occasion. Although the Iranians and the Russians both had came together under Prime Minister Medvedev and stated and another attack like that was done there on the airfield there after the uh, 59 uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles came against Syria, that, that it could very well end up being a war with Russia. But I think sometimes that's just a little bit of rhetoric to kind of make themselves look good. I don't think Russia is willing to fight that hard for Syria. At least that's my take on it. Maybe North Korea could be a different situation altogether, but when it comes to the situation there in Syria, I believe that is a completely different situation altogether. Let's continue on in David's article here. He says here, the diplomatic source has said Trump's administration now has a clear position from Assad after intelligence apparatus in Washington, London, and Paris received proofs that the Syrian regime was 100% responsible about the chemical attack in Khan Shekun. Now, David's not agreeing that this really happened. He's just showing you what's being written there because we find that out later in his article. But he goes on to say that the Trump administration informed Lavrov during this week's talks in Washington about three no's. No peace with Assad, no stability with Assad, and no reconstruction with Assad, the source said. They added, however, that Washington was lenient regarding the method of the timing of Assad's exit from Syria and said Trump's administration accepts those matters to be managed by Moscow, including a possibility that Russia host Assad in return of a U.S. pledge that he would not be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. So, Basically, it looks like to me what's going to happen, the carrot that's dangling before Russia is, we'll turn our head, the U.S. would say, to Russia, while you annex the eastern part of Ukraine. And we, you turn your head, Russian President Putin, while we send our forces in to take down Damascus. And if you'd like to kind of look like a knight in shining armor, well, you can go gallop in there with a few helicopters, rescue uh uh, President Bashar al-Assad, his wife and family there, and you can hightail them back to Russia for a safe haven for them. 
But you know what the problem is when that all happens? Well, exactly. That's when we're going to start to see the prophecy over here in Damascus. Yes, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Because I can tell you one thing. When the U.S. goes in there, Assad's forces are going to fight no matter what. Even if you take and slip in there and rescue President Bashar al-Assad, remember Washington's plan is leave the forces of Assad in there and put it under an Alaw Alawadi control. Hmm, not going to turn out good. And the worst thing of it all, verse 3, Isaiah 17, the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. So the kingdom, those kings that have always protected the Ephraimites, the house of Israel that had converted to Christianity many years ago when the man called Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, had come and had delivered the children of Israel that had reached out to the house of Israel when he told his apostles, go only into the way of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There had been many converts over in the region of Syria, in Damascus especially. And even according to BBC, as we shared the other night, said the oldest Christian known population in the world was that of Damascus. Well, when Damascus crumbles, so will that fortress cease from Ephraim and they will destroy the Christians that are living there. And of course, also Isaiah does blame what? He actually blames Israel, the children of Israel though. By the way, it's not just modern day Israel. When the prophet here writes about the children of Israel, all right, what does he say here? Let's back up and look in verse nine. And in that day shall the strong cities be as a forsaken places, which were forsaken from the children of Israel after the manner of woods of lofty forest, and it shall be a desolation. For thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. He says children of Israel because the United States has a lot of the house of Israel there. And of course, modern day Israel being the house of Judah, it is all the children of Israel, even through Europe, the allies, the British forces, they come together. It's because they have forgotten the God of their salvation and they are, and Israel is not mindful of her own rock. She doesn't know that Yeshua is her Messiah. And of course, the, 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 the house of Israel, being those that are from America, the, those in the government there, those that are in the government and the British government there, that are parts of the house of Israel that have, that have escaped to these lands here, they have forgotten the God of their salvation, that Jesus Christ is their God of their salvation. They forgot about him. And that's what causes them to go in there and to pl plummet Damascus and bring it down to raise it to the ground. What a shame. Uh, but is Russia going to back off? I think they will. So anyway, look, let's look back at David's article. Trump also informed Lavrov during the second round of talks that the U.S. refuses to play a role in the Geneva and Aston, uh, uh, Astana talks in return for the insist, uh, insistence to see a U.S.-Russian deal on Syria that could be start a bilateral relations between the two sides. And that could develop to include an additional agreement on Ukraine. The reports are considered highly credible and fit uh, with a satellite intelligence that shows a heavy concentration of U.S. armored vehicles massed on Jordans ready to invade Syria in a short notice as part of a coalition response. The imaginary gas attack to be used as a justification of potential deal on the Ukraine, Ukraine, the carrot now dangling before the Russians. So has the Russians taken that carrot? Well, I think they did. Uh, our good friend Lorenzo, by the way, that is the uh, picture of the uh, troops there, uh, part of the group that is amassed on the Syrian border. Um, and kind of thought that was interesting to share with you. But also our good friend uh, Lorenzo, and already happened, he is now sharing this image here that just came out today. Large Russian military convoy spotted in Rostov Oblast about 30 to 50 kilometers from the Ukrainian border, likely M4 highway, highway M4 that is. And yes, that is right on the doorsteps of Ukraine. Look at right here. There you can see M4 here on the screen and behind you. This here is, is uh, the Don, Donetsk, Luhansk region here. Uh, actually, Donetsk right here, the road that goes in. So yes, Russia has got a massive amount of troops on their border. And what do you have over there on the border of Syria? You have the U.S. forces all massed up over there, Russia massing up their troops on the Ukrainian border, and both are just going to kind of turn a blind eye as they cross over into the two different sides there to take down uh, the groups that they need to take down. Russia, though, all they're going to do is just make sure that 
uh, Petro Poroshenko doesn't go any further than what he's been going. And that way, maybe Petro Poroshenko will back off of the border. Who knows what will actually happen? But anyway, that's where we're looking at right now. And uh, turning our, our attention to another interesting news point here, uh, Murad Gazdiev, uh, RT reporter on his own Twitter page here, he put out this really interesting articles here, North Korea test fires what could be new kind of a longer range missile. Now they've been downplaying this in US media, but according to the article here, Murad brought out, this missile actually reached an altitude of 2,000 kilometers. It is an intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM. What do you know? Murad, good job, my friend. That thing went up that high, came back down to Earth, and uh, crashed in the Sea of Japan. They were just wanting to see if they could actually do it. He found another. This is on a Japanese site. May 13th, North Korean missile rose more than 2,000 kilometers in an altitude of Japan. Defense Ministry stated that. A missile fired by North Korea Sunday morning reached an altitude of 2,000 kilometers, 1,245 miles, and could be a new type of missile, Japan's Defense Ministry, Tomoe uh, Anada said. You don't think that there's not plans to go take down uh, North Korea next? I am sure there is. And uh, that is not going to be good news. That is something that's been, like I said, has been downplayed in Western media. Uh, Murad Gaziev, God bless him. I, I really appreciate him. We've stayed in contact uh, over time there. And he's really been uh, uh, an amazing source to help us out in a time of need too about things going on inside of Syria. Uh, let me share something here with you though uh, in closing our broadcast. This young lady right here, she is, um, uh, she is a... North Korean girl that escaped her uh, her father her mother they had escaped North Korea when she was about 13 years old and I'm just going to share just a few seconds here of this commercial with you this was actually on a friend of my brother's uh, uh, page which he's a friend of mine as well a Japanese man and uh, but I want you to hear some of the things that this young lady says here just a few seconds I'll put a link to this in here her story will make you recognize what it says, how precious freedom is, posted by Love What Matters. Uh, they posted this, uh, this comments that she makes. She does speak English, and uh, she, uh, I believe, I don't know if she's living in China or Japan. I think she's living in Japan now, but let's just listen to what she says here about North Korea. And this is what I was saying recently. If you go to start bombing North Korea, don't forget there is a lot of women, children, that do not like what Kim Jong-un is doing. They do not want to be a part of this and they would love to be free. So if we just go to nuke this country, you're killing a lot of innocent people that want nothing to do with this regime. And this little girl's testimony is a clear, clear message that these type of people exist, including the men. So keep in mind, don't just think because all these men, oh, they could be part of the military. I guarantee you one thing, 90% of North Koreans do not want to be in North Korea with the leader they have today. Please listen. See, North Korea is an unimaginable country. There is only one channel on TV. There is only one internet. We aren't free to sing, say, wear, or think what we want. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read some of it as we go because I don't know how clear you can understand or it's easy for me. I'm used to accents. We, are, we aren't free to sing, wear, or think what we want. North Korea is the only country in the world that executes people for making unauthorized international phone calls. North Korea is the only country in the world that executes people for making unauthorized international phone calls. North Koreans are being terrorized today. North Koreans are being terrorized today. When I was growing up in North Korea. When I was growing up in North Korea. I never saw anything about love stories between men and women. I never saw no. anything about love stories between men and women. No books, no books, songs, no, no press. Songs, no press. No movies about love stories. No movies about love stories. There is no Romeo and Juliet. There is no Romeo Every and Juliet. Every story was propaganda to brainwash us. Every story was a propaganda to brainwash us about the Kim dictators. About the Kim dictators. I was born in 1993. She was born in 1993. I was 
and she was abducted at birth. Even before I knew the words, freedom, or human rights. I'm going to just post it now from there on for you guys. She has a tremendous story, this young lady. I don't know her name even at this point. I just saw the video just moments before coming on the news broadcast tonight, but I wanted to share this with the world uh, for you to see that people like this young lady, she talks about her mother being raped, and she said if it hadn't have been that her mother was raped, that they would have raped her at 13 years of age. And she said, they say in Korea, women are strong, and she said, my mother was strong for me. It is a heartbreaking story to listen to this. But she talks about the millions of Koreans, North Koreans, that do not want to be a part of this type of dictatorship. So if Kim Jong-un is removed from power, the way he's removed is very important that it's done in a way to preserve life. And she also talks about how that China is not much better. She talks about how China should be doing something to help us. She says in this testimony here that the Chinese often take and sell girls from North Korea that escaped the country for only $200. That's a shame. They escape one horrible situation to go to another. I'm Stephen Benin. You're watching Israeli News Live. Here.